Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to have uh, Percy Leon here with us uh, for the day, actually. Uh, Percy is an assistant professor uh, in, in the computer science department at Stanford University. His uh, research interests include modeling natural language semantics and also developing machine learning methods that infer, re infer rich latent structures from limited supervision. Uh, just this year, he has a lot of awards. I think very recently from Ishkai, he had an award, uh, the Ishkai Computers and Thought Award. Also in 2016, an NSF Career Award. Uh, 2015, last year, a Sloan Research Fellowship. I should also mention that he was a Microsoft Research Faculty Fellow in 2014. And I believe Persis has also been an intern a few decades ago with us at Microsoft Research. Only one decade ago, not a few <laughs> decades ago. <laughs> All right, just one. Um, today, um, Percy uh, actually has two parts in the talk uh, he will have today. One part is a research talk, and the other part uh, addresses one of his passion, which is about making research reproducible, fully reproducible, and he would be talking about Codalab, which is actually an effort I've had the player and pleasure and honor to, uh, to work with um, uh, Percy and interact with him uh, on that project. So with that, please let's welcome Percy. Thanks, Evelyn, for the introduction. And thanks to all of you for coming. So um, as you can tell from the title, there's really two parts to this talk. And so th I think the time is scheduled to go until 12, but I'm going to, no one wants to really sit through an hour and a half of me talking. So I'm going to try to kind of breeze through the first part, but please ask questions if you have any. Um, OK, so to begin, we live in the era of big data. There's so much data that we don't know what possibly we can do with it. Um, um, fortunately, you know, there, we've been seeing a lot of uh, success using deep learning techniques to handle this data. Um, and it has led to a lot of advances in speech recognition, vision, language, and so on. So what more could you possibly want? Well, so there is this uh, story of um, you know, a guy who's uh, looking for his keys under the, the lamppost. And a police officer comes to him and says, why are you looking under a lamppost? And he says, well, that's where the light is. And sometimes I feel like the research community also is kind of like this, where we look um, under, you know, we work on these big data problems because that's where the data is. OK, but this is not what this talk is about. Um, this talk is about the shadows, about places where there isn't data, and we want to still do some learning. So what, what could possibly be here if that's of interest? So I'll give you two anecdotes um, from my own personal research. So a few years ago, I was talking to Shannon Peters and Chris uh, Ray. They had uh, created a database by extracting facts about uh, fossils. And I said, hey, wouldn't it be great to build a natural language interface so that researchers and students could go and ask questions about this database and understand, basically, uh, fossils and um, how life of, or, uh, arose? better. And I asked um, the first question, I said, well, you know, what kind of questions would you like the system to support? Do you have any examples? Maybe I can train a model. Um, and of course, the answer is, well, you know, this system doesn't exist. There's no users. So then there's no data. Here's another example. More recently, I've been talking to Monica Clam, who's at Stanford, who has developed this um, thing talk, which is a language for querying the Internet of Things in a safe and uh, secure way. Um, and again, this, you know, the same uh, script goes, can we, would it be cool if we build a natural language interface so you can go talk to your fridge or something? And, um, you know, again, there's no users, so we don't have any data. So both of these examples, and you can probably find more from your uh, personal lives, um, is a problem where we don't have a system. So then we don't have users sitting there and talking to a non-existent system. So there's no users. So we really have nothing, OK? And so how do we bootstrap from zero? And I want to emphasize this is not unsupervised learning. So unsupervised learning says, OK, I don't have outputs, but I still have inputs. 
And I can go, maybe go annotate these outputs, or I can do some sort of unsupervised learning. Um, really, we have nothing. Okay. So I think I've made the point clear enough. OK, so let's um, formalize this uh, setting mathematically. OK, so here's a setup. So your, your boss comes to you and says, um, we just signed a contract that we're going to build human level NLP, uh, and we're going to ship tomorrow. OK, so, so what do you do? Um, well, the first thing you should probably do is just quit. Um, <laughs> but the, if you don't want to quit, um, then you can come to my talk, and I'll tell you what you can do about this. So I'm going to talk about three um, avenues of dealing with this, uh, this nasty boss. OK, so to begin with, this is an ACL paper from last year um, with Yushi and Jonathan. And the idea is, um, just to set the stage, we're doing semantic parsing, which has been a kind of a research area of mine for the last five years. And the idea is that in executable semantic parsing, we're taking sentences, we're mapping them onto some logical form or program or database query that can be executed on a database to produce the answer. So you don't have, I'm going to show you logical forms that look like this. You don't have to understand the details, but you can see that this is a set of articles, the things that appeared in ACL, intersect and count them up. So it's some sort of little computation. And so this logical form connects the language to the actual answer. And there's a long history of uh, semantic parsing over the last uh, two decades. Uh, you know, Luke Zettermoyer and Ray Mooney did a lot of seminal work. And recently, there's been a lot of interest um, with you know, the rise of Siri and kind of the return to kind of um, interest in deep language understanding. Um, what I really like about executable semantic parsing is that it kind of really connects language to something that the user would want in the real world. Um, so how do we go about building a semantic parser? So traditionally, you go and maybe get a bunch of sentences somehow. Maybe you just write them down. Maybe you ask um, people to write them down for you. And then you go annotate them with logical forms. Or if you're um, a bit more clever, you can annotate them with sen um, answers. And then you can infer the logical forms. So we've been doing this for the last five years. But the problem is still that this is pretty ad hoc, and it has incomplete coverage. Just to give you an anecdote, three years ago we released this data set, Web Questions, um, which was you know, one of the kind of the first large uh, scale QA data sets. But then we realized that there were no numerical relations in the data set. It's like, oh, shoot, you know, what a big omission. Um, so instead of starting with a language, which is ad hoc, why don't we start with what we have? So what do we have? Well, we have a database. Or if you're building a natural language interface into a fridge, you have a fridge or your car or whatever. And so each of these um, databases gives you a set of uh, you know, relations, of primitives, like author publication data and so on. And what we're going to do is take these and combine them in all sorts of different ways compositionally to create the logical forms. And then we can go and ask people how to t uh, target this logical form using natural language. And this gives us. Uh, Examples of sentences logical form pairs. Okay, so there's two. Um, okay, so I'm going to skip this slide. So th there's kind of two challenges. One is that this number of outputs is infinite. This is the whole point of semantic parsing is that you can target an infinite space. So you can't just go through and ask people to enumerate, um, give you natural language for each of them. And the second challenge is that even if you could, you go and ask uh, Amazon Mechanical Work. A Turker, um, hey, give me some natural language for this. Um, this is just not going to happen. Okay, so how are we going to deal with the two challenges? First, um, let's look at the problem of infinite output space. So clearly, you shouldn't need to gather all infinite uh, logical forms. So because of compositionality, right? So if I have these two sentences after 2011 in ACL, then I really kind of don't need this because I've understood kind of um, if I understood anything about language, then I know I should be able to connect these two. Um, and this is the kind of the good case. But even if you have, you know, after 2011, if you get these two sentences before 2016, then um, if you look at how, what is a natural way to realize this logical form, it's between. between. It's not after and before. Right? So then there's a case where the alignment between the natural language and the logical form isn't um, perfect. And you probably would want need to see this to kind of capture all of um, language. But the key idea is that um, this type of what I'm calling kind of bound uh, alignment mismatch 
is bounded. It's not the case that you have arbitrary um, length 20 logical forms mapping to arbitrary length 20 sentences. You probably have a little bit of non-compositionality uh, locally. Um, so, so we'll see how this uh, comes about later. OK, so challenge two. We're not being going to be able to show people logical forms. Um, so what happens if we just show them natural language? OK, so um, let's show them natural language. But um, actually generating natural language from logical forms is basically just as hard um, if we want to get most cited articles and CS. Um, but the, the, I guess the insight is that there are many ways in natural language to realize the same semantics. And indeed, that's kind of the power of uh, natural language is that you can say any of these and it will canonicalize to the semantic form. So by reversing this process, um, what we're doing is saying, OK, why don't we just choose to generate some utterance? All we need is some utterance that captures the semantics of the logical form and is understandable. And we're going to weaken the assumption a little bit. We're going to generate things like article with field CS at the most article site. So it's not very fluent, but you can read it and understand it. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to write down a small grammar that defines a, a set of candidate logical forms and what we call the canonical utterances. So these are utterances which realize the semantics, are understandable, but not perfect English. And we're going to do them up to size 3. So remember the bounded non uh, alignment mismatch. So we can do them up to size 3. And then now we take these uh, sentences, and then we go and ask our Turk workers to write them into more fluent English. So one thing that I was kind of a side effect of this project, which was kind of cool, is that um, you know that allows cats and that allows dogs actually becomes pet friendly, right? So there's a lot of um, kind of compression that goes on. Um, and this is kind of exposing the fact that you often have these kind of almost macros in language. So it's individual words that actually um, expand to a richer uh, semantics. OK? All right, so we did some experiments. We looked at um, eight domains. Um, you know, we basically went through and uh, generated logical forms, canonical utterances, asked people to paraphrase them. And then we trained a centered um, semantic parsing model. And um, here are the results. So we compared uh, kind of a baseline model with um, some paraphrasing features and then our full system. And using the lexicalized features um, is a substantial improvement over the, the baseline. And the point of this is that if we try to train a kind of a generic model that handles all domains, that just doesn't work very well. Um, and we kind of really need this domain-specific jargon, right? So you might imagine, oh, why don't we just build one semantic parser to rule them all, and not, you know, then we're not really in this learning from zero setting. But um, but it turns out that in new domains, you actually, because you're doing end-to-end -end language understanding, you actually need data in that domain to figure out what to deal with it. Okay, so the summary of this section is um, the high-level takeaway is that. When you have kind of no data, you can actually bootstrap it by, if you have enough structure on your output space, you can generate the outputs and then go backwards to figure out what the inputs are. And I think we, there might be other uh, ways of exploring these ideas in other domains. OK, any questions uh, before I move on? So in your previous slide, you can go back and yeah. this, uh, what, are, what are these numbers? So this is uh, accuracy of the answer. Okay. So we trained a semantic parser, and then we test had a test. Huh? What's, the, what's the test? So we, when we gathered this data set, we split it up into train and test. Yeah. 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 So when you automatically generate these logical forms from your structured data, like knowledge base, there will be many logical forms that are not sensible. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, not corresponding to an interesting question. Right. And how do you deal with that? Yeah, that's what a good point. Um, so there are a lot of logical forms which are just kind of weird, like uh, before 3 p.m. and allows cats. Um, and in those cases, it's not bad. We're just going to get you know, a kind of a strict compositionality. Right? And um, because we're only going up to size 3, we're not wasting too much effort in you know, exploring kind of not interesting logical forms. 
Um, in the future, what we'd like to do is uh, if we go up to size three, and then we realize that um, maybe before and after when they com are together, that's interesting. Then we can explore larger logical forms that only have kind of interesting subcomponents and kind of like a um, best first search. Let me miss that part. Uh, how do you get these volume forms in the first place? Uh, so we have a bunch of primitives. Okay. And then we just uh, add them or the join um, oh, them so into logical forms. I think so some logic forms are not, might, might not be uh, better. Uh, so they're going to be valid because we have, um, they're, they're programs, right? So we can execute them if, they're don't, if they crash, then they're not valid. Yeah, so person, why did you say this is something that starts from nothing? You don't have database to start with. Right? Yeah, so starting with zero language. OK. <laughs> yeah. From a language point of view. Yeah. Okay. OK, let me move on since I have a lot to get through. OK, so at this point, you go back to your boss. You say, OK, great. We, we're able to deploy eight different systems overnight. And then your boss says, well, you know, you only got 58% accuracy. That's really not good enough. And I really want 90% accuracy at least. OK, so now, now you should or maybe quit. But um, <laughs> let's, uh, let's stick it through and see what So, so you what probably call that transfer learning. Like, you transfer from whatever database knowledge, embedding in database into whatever domain you want to do. Um, it's not it's traditional not transfer it's learning. Not where you have one classification problem and another classification okay, so problem. But it is using so knowledge, knowledge yeah. OK, so this is a project uh, with Keenan, Arun, and Chris Manning from NIPS 2015. And the situation is getting a little bit more dire. You have zero data, and you still want high accuracy. Okay, So what are you going to do? Well, we have to change the, the spec a little bit. So um, so we're built on the seminal work uh, from the 18th century, where you have the, the Turk, which is allegedly uh, this machine that plays chess, but it really has a human inside. Okay. So what we but it would be kind of lame if I concluded this part of the talk by saying, okay, we're just going to have humans do it, and you know, um, but, but so we're going to go a little bit further and do what we call on-the-job learning. And the idea is that this uh, machine or this young chap is. Um, you know, on the job, making uh, useful horseshoes or whatever. And um, if he doesn't know something, he can ask uh, the, the machine, in case this uh, old master. And over time, he's going to become better and better and ask the master less. Okay? So we're going to formalize this intuition, um, scaling back from the kind of semantic parsing just to kind of sequence labeling. And so the motivation ap motivating application is that you have a natural uh, disaster disaster and people are tweeting left and right about kind of where food and shelter is and you want to be able to uh, build a named entity recognizer kind of on really quickly. Okay, so what we want to do is take sentences and label them with either resources or location um, or other. So we use a standard uh, conditional random field model where there's edge potentials and node potentials. Um, and so here's a key slide that demonstrates how we're going to ask for help. Okay, so we have a sentence come in, and initially we don't know what the true labels are, but we have this uh, CRF model that gives us some sort of indication. And so at this point, we can't, we can predict, but we're probably going to be wrong. So what instead we're going to do is ask for help. We're going to uh, request at y1 and y3, um, tell me the label. Okay, so this is kind of the state of the system, um, and you wait. The current time goes. And then at time three, maybe this one comes back and says, oh, this is a resource. This one still hasn't come back. You wait a little bit more. This one comes back with person. Maybe you don't trust this, actually, because George is a person, but in this context, is not a person. Suppose you suspected something. You can ask another Turker and wait some more, and then this comes back. Maybe at this point, you say, OK, I think I have enough information. And now you can um, basically do inference under this graphical model, which is original CRF with additional uh, potentials, and now you predict uh, the, the right answer. Okay? So here the idea is that because we have these edge potentials, you don't need to query everything. And um, so the question is, which position do you query and when do you query them? Because you're also in this kind of temporal online setting. So there's this 
kind of trade-off between accuracy, time, and money, right? You can spend more money, ask more people to get uh, more, you can query more positions to get more accuracy. You can also um, reduce the latency by asking 100 per people to label every position, and then just whenever people come back, uh, you know, the, take them in, that's going to be uh, earlier than like the mean, for example. But how do you actually kind of, um, you know, formalize this? Um, because this is kind of gets pretty confusing quickly. So what we did was um, we formalized in a kind of Bayesian decision theoretic framework. Um, the basic idea is we write down what we want, and now we just optimize and do the Bayesian thing. Um, of course, this is kind of uh, tricky computationally, um, so I'm going to talk about how we deal with this. Um, so the clearest way to see what is going on is via a game tree. So the game is between um, the system who's trying to make queries and uh, the environment who is the crowd. Okay, so in the beginning, um, what are the choices? Well, we can ask for the label of y1, or we can ask for a label of y2, or we can just wait and see what happens. So if we ask for y1, and then maybe we ask for y2, and then maybe we wait. So when we wait, the control passes to the environment, and we wait for some um, Turker to come back. And there are many things that can happen. So um, some random amount of time could elapse, and then we could either get the query, the response to y1 or y2, um, because both y1 and y2 are um, in flight, and they're kind of asynchronous. And each of these could come back with either resource, location, or other. So th there's kind of many possibilities here. Um, and then once we pick one of them, then we continue the game. Okay. So let's delve into this one a little bit to um, talk about what the dynamics of the system are. So the dynamics specify a transition from one state to another state where um, something has been returned. So we model the time elapsed as um, a simple gamma distribution. Um, and we have a CRF model, which conditions on the sentence, but also all the, um, all the responses that we've gotten so far. That defines a possible distribution over um, correct uh, labels y. And then um, because there's a human error, we say that um, with probability 0.3, um, we get a random label. So this specifies the distribution of our new states given previous states, which advances time and gives us kind of responses to one particular query. Okay, so at the bottom of the game tree, we have this final state where the final action is turned in. And to assess this, here's where we just kind of um, write down what we want. So we have, remember, we want accuracy, we want to minimize the amount of time that we spent. And then we also want to minimize the number of queries, because for every query, we have to pay some fixed amount of money. OK, so in conclusion, we have this game tree with um, basically we are trying to compute the max over all actions. And over here, we're trying to compute the expectation with respect to the environment. And then at the bottom, we have some kind of arbitrary crazy cost function. So this is clearly going to be really intractable. So we use Monte Carlo tree search. Um, and I'm going to skip the details. Um, we have one issue that we need to do with uncountable number of uh, transitions, but I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. Yeah. A uh, quick silly question. So uh, this formulation looks sort of sequential in the sense that you sort of like request one thing at a time from the crowd. Yeah. Uh, and then. So this is, doesn't have to be because here um, I'm requesting y1 and y2. And then waiting. So when you oh, wait, you return action. So got it, got it, got it. yeah, this would actually be equivalent to selecting y2 and y1. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to skip these details. You can ask me later. Um, so the, just to summarize the final algorithm, um, the system is going to receive an input sentence from the user, and then while um, I don't have enough confidence to turn in the answer. I'm going to run MCTS to compute the best action, which could be query, wait, or turn in. And then if I'm waiting, then I actually get a wait for the human response and add it to my state. And then at the end, we're going to return the argmax over the, um, you know, tr the labels. And then we're going to update the parameters. Okay. So I should point out that um, we are 
this is kind of the using Bayesian decision theory, but only in the kind of inner loop of making predictions. So this aspect of updating the parameters lies outside the Bayesian decision theory. So we're not choosing actions to tell us how to learn the best model. We're um, choosing actions to make the best predictions here. So the tree is growing in time? Make sure I understand The tree is it's growing, growing, growing in time, or is it static? Uh, the tree, well, it's not uh, conceptually, no, because in the beginning, you have the entire game tree. And as you progress the game, you walk down the game tree, and then you're only searching the subtree there, just kind of like in a normal game. OK, so we done, did some experiments on this uh, named entity recognition, compared what happens if you query every position five times using a simple threshold baseline in our full system. And here, the adaptive systems um, outperform the, um, this. Basically, having five votes or the adaptive systems outperforms you know, only querying each position once or three times. Um, if you look at in terms of accuracy, or F1, um, in terms of latency, you see that the adaptive methods are, um, which were getting equal accuracy or a little bit better accuracy than this, are doing much better than asking um, five queries for every one. And then um, also we save a lot of money by um, using kind of our Bayesian decision theory system. What, what are the units for time? Time is seconds, seconds or milliseconds rather here. So this is milliseconds per um, uh, query. Yeah, suppose you have to hit the lambda one, lambda one, lambda two to wait, you know, three terms. Mm -hmm. Did you put that through? Yeah, we didn't. Uh, ex I mean, we just fixed it to something. It? I don't remember what the constants were, but you can play around if you value money or time more. Yeah. Um, I'm going to actually kind of skip this um, and just actually conclude. So, here the basic idea is um, you know, in this kind of complex decision making problem where you have asynchrony and then you have to make requests, um, we saw that Bayesian decision theory gave you some guidance on how to uh, write things down. Um, and if you wanted to you know, adjust your um, time accuracy trade offs, you can kind of do that declaratively. And one thing that we like to consider in the future is considering other types of operations besides just querying an individual position, which is very low level. In semantic parsing in particular, you can ask people to um, label logical forms to get the answer, uh, maybe paraphrase. And um, this framework would actually allow you to learn which one of these um, questions that you ask the crowd would be most effective. OK, so going back to the boss. You're saying, OK, we got 90% accuracy. Actually, we got 88.5 accuracy, but you round up. OK, it's OK. And um, the boss says, well, we are bankrupt because you spend all of the money on uh, you know, Mechanical Turk. So um, OK, so now what do you do? Well, you should, you know, we should probably quit you, like you know, two months ago. But um, there is a third part of the talk, and I'm going to try to salvage the situation. So here we really have to change the, the, the setting. Okay? And to do that, let's, uh, so this is actually um, coming out of ACL this year so with Sida and Chris. Um, and the situation is really dire. You have zero data, you have zero money, and you want still something good. So obviously you can't get 100% accuracy or anything like that, but you want something good. Okay, so what is this good something? Well, let's take a step back, right? What are we doing? OK, so we could be building um, natural language parsers. Or we could be in the business of um, you know, making interfaces that, so that the users can get whatever they want done. They want to send their email. They want to find directions to the airport or whatever. And so from this perspective, if they are able to achieve their goal, then we should be happy. So let's change the, the setup. And to kind of um, evoke kind of the spirit of what we're going to do, um, so Wittgenstein in 1953 in his philosophical investigations um, famously said that language derived its meaning from use. Right? So we often think of language, at least as a language person, you think about the meaning of sentences and the structure and the syntax and all of this. But really, I think you know, Wittgenstein was pointing out that 
the, I, the meaning of language is actually uh, fully contextual. It depends on how it's uh, getting used. And he in introduces the idea of language game where people, this kind of almost uh, thought experiment where people can actually uh, develop a primitive language through the context of some activity or goal. Okay? So what we're going to do is to operationalize this um, in a simple setting, which we call Shirlun, should learn in homage to Shir, Terry Winograd, Shirley from the, the 70s. And the idea is that there's a user and a system, and the user sees the goal, but the system does not, and only the system can perform actions. So in this case, you want to remove this red block. But the user, obviously, he's a human, he knows language, but the system, importantly, has no knowledge of language. Okay, so this is what happens when you have zero data. You have no language. Um, so what the user is going to do is it's going to say something. The system doesn't really know. It's going to generate a bunch of hypotheses. And then the user is going to give feedback and say, this is the one I want. And the system can actually execute this action, advance the state, and the game kind of goes on. Okay, so this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, okay, so... I'm going to say, let's see, what am I doing? Remove, uh, let's say remove orange. Um, okay, so it doesn't understand what I meant. So I'm going to scroll through. I'm pretty, pushing the down arrow and scroll through to something which I want. And then I'm going to click check and then I give feedback to the machine. And now uh, if I say remove orange, um, you know, it can know what I mean. Um, it doesn't understand colors, so I have to really teach all the colors. Um, remove red, but once I taught a color, it knows what it's uh, talking about. Remove brown. Um, um, okay, so now I'm adding orange to rightmost uh, block, and then I have to scroll a little bit, and then so on. So I'm not going to go through all. This is actually demos online. You can go play with it. But over time, you get to more kind of interesting configurations, and uh, also richer language, okay? So the idea is that through the process of the user playing this game, the game objective is just to get the goal. It's not to do anything with language, but you're forced to, in some sense, uh, through the construction of the game, um, to teach the computer some language, okay? So, the, so that's the setup. I really want kind of language to follow out from some goal rather than, oops, um, um, than just kind of hand specifying what is the out of we want. Okay, so what are the logical forms? So uh, very briefly, we have logical forms that, so here is all the blocks which are brown, oops, um, leftmost uh, brown block, um, all but the leftmost left brown block, and remove the all but the leftmost brown block. So you can kind of get an idea of the compositional structure here. Um, we use a simple log linear model with, um, and learning is just a single stochastic gradient update. We went to Mechanical Turk. We had 100 different people play this in their own parallel universes and teaching the language, their own language to uh, the computer. Right? We explicitly did not write examples in English because we didn't really want to bias people. We just kind of, actually, this is partly a cocci experiment. We want to see how people react to this uh, setting. And then, so here's what we got. So here are the players who were the best, ranked 1 through 20 out of 100, which means these were the people who uh, required the fewest number of uh, scrolls, so th uh, three on average. And you can see that there's many ways to be successful. You can use basically something like English, or you can invent your own shorthand, and those computer just learns whatever you taught, taught it. Okay? Um, if you look at the average players, you'll see that um, Either people were less consistent with their language use, which made it harder for the computer to learn, or sometimes people had a mismatch between what they wanted and what the computer was actually capable of doing. So we don't support absolute positions, so um, this was just kind of dropped on the floor. So it was harder for this player to actually get um, what he wanted. And if you look at the worst players, um, either they're kind of uh, spamming us or this person um, forgot or, I don't know, didn't put spaces in uh, the, the, the sentences, which means that our model was not able to generalize across any of these sentences. So it was really, really slow to learn. Okay, so you get an idea of, um, this is actually a really fun project because you could actually see um, 
how kind of the computer and human were kind of adapting to each other over time. Um, so, so here's some interesting examples. So it doesn't have to be English. So one person decided to teach uh, Polish, and another person decided to use Polish notation. I'm not making this up. People actually you know, did this. Um, so, so that was fun. Okay. But when we were playing the game ourselves, we noticed that something was kind of um, missing. The system wasn't learning fast enough. And so if the system saw this example, and I say, remove cyan, then the system will actually happily suggest remove red as a top candidate. Because under the prior, it's only seen remove red. So you know, it doesn't know what cyan means. So it thinks, OK, re 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 basically regress to the prior. But this is clearly bad, right? Because you know, if I had, as a human, if I wanted to say remove red, I probably wouldn't have said remove cyan. I probably would have said remove red. Right? So as humans, we have this intuition um, of mutual exclusivity. So people who study children language acquisition have you know, noticed this quite a bit with how kids learn language. And this makes the learning much faster. Okay? So we don't want to put this in as a kind of a hack. What we did was to, we want this to kind of arise out of a principle. And the principle we adopted goes back to kind of Paul Grice thinking about pragmatics of language, where language use is, um, language is kind of this game between two players, a speaker and a listener, and they're trying to communicate. Okay, so if you're trying to develop a strategy, so the system will say, okay, I saw this utterance. What does it mean? Well, how do I figure it out? Well, in my head, there is this human out there who tried, is trying to tell me something. So how did the human generate the, the sentence? Well, he probably had in mind some logical form, and then he was thinking, if I said the sentence, how would the computer interpret it? Okay? So th this is kind of a line of work um, which we did uh, in uh, about six years ago, and uh, Noah Goodman and Mike Frank, if you heard of kind of um, RSA, is, uh, is kind of, they've developed this framework further. So the idea is to model kind of communication as um, this game theoretic, uh, in this game theoretic manner. Okay, so walking through a simple example. So if we were just using our original semantic parsing model, so then I get a distribution over um, sentences, uh, sorry, logical forms conditioned on sentence. So you'll see that um, you know, remove cyan with, uh, is going to get remove red. Um, but if we recurse, so what is the speaker thinking? The speaker is thinking basically using Bayes rules with respect to the underlying um, um, the semantic parsing model. And then if you look at what the listener is doing, the listener is using Bayes' rule with respect to the speaker and, uh, uh, and using Bayes' rule again. And then you see what the listener will do is actually assign higher probability to things which are not with remove red. Right? So it still doesn't necessarily know what remove red, um, remove cyan means, but it knows it's probably not with red. So we implemented this algorithm, and initially, we didn't really see much of an improvement. And then we thought, well, you know, why isn't it improving things? Well, it's not improving things because, um, you know, why should it, right? So this is, we're making a modeling assumption where the speaker is, we're making certain commitments about what the human is actually doing. And so if the human is not doing that, what we said the human should be doing, then we're not going to see any gains. Um, and in particular, there are some players who are good, who are cooperative, and then there's players who just type random stuff. So we look at the players who are in the top 10 who are actually being cooperative. And there we saw a nice gain. Right? So this kind of is a kind of a modeling lesson where you know, we have the pragmatics, it's kind of a nice story, but it really only helps if the model is correct, if the, if the um, humans are actually being cooperative. OK, so what I really like about this project is that the downstream goal, some language external goal, is driving the language learning. And you know, it's, it's, communication is a two-sided street. I mean, both the human and the computer are adapting over time. And um, we saw that pragmatics is, uh, 
uh, is quite useful in cases where the model is correct. Okay. Okay. So now, final stand with um, standoff with a boss. So now all the users are addicted to our game because it's so fun. You can. This is actually well, we didn't actually. We still had to. We still had to pay mechanical Turk workers, but in the future, I hope to actually create a game where um, people will just play for fun. And then um, the boss says, okay, mission accomplished. We can go home now. All right, so to summarize, um, we started by looking at the bootstrapping problem. We have no users, no system. And we showed three possible ways of tackling this problem where you're becoming more and more, um, I guess, aggressive about changing the framework. So initially, we said, Let's just gather some data offline to try to cover the input space. Um, what happens if we have workers that help us uh, make predictions? And then in this case, the workers are and the users become kind of one entity. And that's the way we can kind of um, bootstrap, I think, most uh, successfully. So a few remarks. Um, I think a lot of success of machine learning is due to just having the data and the compute. I mean, um, the algorithms haven't, have changed a bit, but I think that's a oh, second order effect. And this talk, I think, encourages us to think about um, data collection and learning together. So, you know, the, the prep and the, the cooking are both really important aspects of learning. And there's so much attention, I think, often to the cooking part, but the prep is actually, if you cook, you realize it takes a lot of um, you know, effort. And the second point is I want to think about not necessarily data sets, and, but think about kind of environments. And I think the last part of the talk where the language game is an excellent example where you know, the value of this uh, the setting is not that fact that we collected 10,000 utterances, but the ability to experiment. Um, and the third point is that I really believe that systems should get better with use. If you say talk to your phone and it doesn't work, I don't want um, to kind of give up and never say that again. I want to be able to teach it and then have it um, fix it so that I can teach it more um, advanced concepts. OK, so any questions before I move on to the second part of my talk, which I will promise to make short? Yeah. Uh, how you, uh, do you have any thoughts on how you could scale up the language game to more complicated settings? Because the one you showed yeah. was fairly simple. But yeah, I imagine right. when you have you know, a lot of you have a huge output space. It's not. It's not really clear how. You can, uh, right. Right. So. So that's a good point. So in the spirit of wanting to have language that uh, is developed from kind of the complexity of the environment. So I don't want to say, okay, well, please type more complicated sentences because in this environment there's no need to, right? But I think once we have a more complicated environment, which we're actually working on, we're working on still kind of in the um, block setting, but more in between the spectrum of Minecraft and where we are right now. Um, and the idea is that now people can build like chairs or different kind of sculptures and things. And I think that um, language learning will have to kind of proceed in kind of these stages, right? So I hinted briefly at kind of these high level concepts. Like when you say afternoon, what is afternoon? I mean, the, the, the difficulty I think is not in understanding like the syntax and you know, uh, of what afternoon is, it's about kind of actually grounding it to the world, right? So you might initially say that, um, well, I understand what before and after are in time, and then I want to say before um, 6 p.m. and after 12 p.m., that's afternoon. So, so I think I imagine that we will want a setting where language learning happens, where the users are kind of teaching these concepts that um, get more and more high level and complex. Yes, so I have a question. I mean, applying the three principles that you talk about here, maybe to spoken dialogue system, for yeah. example, but the first part will be equivalent to something like using database, maybe to bootstrap in you know, apology, you know, for the, some domains where you don't have the data. Mm -hmm. And I think the third part is easier as well. Once you get something going, you know, it's easy to learn from the users. Now, the second part will be like, uh, I, I wasn't able to think about what will be the uh, so the yeah. second part is, uh, for example, you have a speech recognizer, and then you have humans who are going to listen to your transcript. Oh, you stuff, right? Yeah, you're crowdsourcing. Right. And I should say that the second, third part is also, I think, uh -huh. non pretty non-standard because typically, whenever you're putting out a system, the contract is that this system will 
be pretty good. It's going to be basically adult, right? But here what I'm saying is that the system is not going to be adult. It's going to be a child, but it's going to be a child that can, you know, learn quickly, hopefully. Okay. But you still have and to let the user to start. The users will have to do it. And I think in practice, we don't want to start from scratch. I think I'm making, trying to make a point that you can start from scratch. But in reality, I think the interesting thing is if you start at wherever we are and try to increase the language. Okay. So, so the, 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 the first part, how does the user simulation fit into the thinking you're talking about? Yeah. Very often, you, know, you don't have any, any data to begin with, you know, yeah. in spoken dialogue. Um, and then typically the way people do is that you use, you know, human, you just pretend that, you know, you're simulating the real application. And sometimes it's not very good, right? Because, you know, whatever you Yeah, so we're not using a user model because so that's going to be hard. That. I mean, we're actually using real users. Yeah. I think that's the point, is that we're... Well, I'm, I'm talking about the first part, right? The first part, using uh, database. Oh, so there are the ideas that we would somehow cover the space. And I think it's actually pretty feasible. I mean, the more, I mean, especially, I think, maybe in a, like, a very wide open domain, it would be difficult. But, but like, in any of these kind of micro domains, I really think that you can just actively probe and ask about, how do you say this? How do you say this? How do you say this? And then you just master the kind of language, at least as an initial seed. Once, once you have the initial model, maybe you can do you know, step two or step three. Yeah, so I think these are all complementary. Yeah. How to deal with adversarial users? Because we put up something like this, they're going to game it, they're going to spam it, they're going to teach it things that are bad if you're Microsoft or Google or something, especially. Right. So how do you deal with that? I can imagine ways to do it, but have you thought about that? Right, so there's, I guess, two settings. One is that um, they're spamming it in a way that doesn't actually help them, and that can be easily detected, and also they you know, if they're actually trying to send email or something and they spam, fine. Okay, you're not sending your email anytime soon. Um, I think the hard part is if you spam it in a way where you're deliberately trying to, you know, let's say I say define red as blue or something. Um, then I think this is where kind of personalization or kind of having not a shared model um, can be important um, where, you know, it, it's fine. If you want to call blue red, go ahead. I'm just going to try to say, okay, you you have your own dialect over here, and you know maybe I share some parameters, but keep it kind of mostly separate. And so there's kind of uh, many techniques and kind of multitask learning that could allow you to do that. Um, yeah. So, so basically, on the first part, um, when we were doing uh, data collection for the Kinect gesture recognition system, the mapping that we wanted to produce was. Uh, say from movements to gestures, yeah. and people sort of uh, have very different movements associated with uh, with particular gestures. For example, the greet gesture, people in the West would greet differently than people yeah. uh, in the East, right? Also, say uh, kicks, right? So even the, even the very well formed gesture like kick, people would have very different notions of what a kick means, yeah. right? Or whether people do it in a, and so there's all, uh, there's subject bias in the data. Which is which arises from people essentially doing it in different ways, but there's also framing bias in how you ask the question, right? Uh, if we uh, say, <clears throat> if we give a textual instruction to a person, say move your hand to the right, uh, they, that's a lot of that's an ambiguous sort of statement. If we show them an image, that's it. That's Slightly less ambiguous. If you show them videos, that's even more, uh, even less ambiguous. But then it restricts the movement. It restricts the, uh, the naturalness right. of the movement that the, that the person wants to do. Yeah. So there are all these sort of questions of subject bias and framing biases. Yeah. And how do you sort of reason about them in in the in, in, in with your reasoning or coverage? Yeah, I mean. I think one way to address the, the point where if you show them kind of a direct stimulus, then they'll not kind of um, do what is most natural for them. But on the other hand, if you say move, then they might do something crazy. Yeah. Um, I think one actually strategy that we've been tr thinking about is, you know, you do it in multiple stages, right? Where you say, okay, you know, why don't you just move your right hand somehow, do, do something, and then you collect some data, and then you in some sense, in the context of natural language, would be paraphrasing. So now let's transform this into something else. And then I think trying to do it in one step might be too much to kind of get the coverage. But if you kind of do it in a course-defined way, maybe you can get it. So, so. 
Next question was basically related to the third part, which is your uh, the target representation that the system understands. Yes. That's fixed. But yeah. So in this, is, uh, so it's fixed in this case, and it's fixed to something small. But I think I want to think about this as the this the world or some let's say Minecraft. Yeah. Right. So it's fixed, but it's extremely expressive and low level and rich, right? And the idea is that you can build up the concepts kind of in a basically unbounded set of ways. And I think we're not there yet, but I think I'm not troubled by the fact that, you know, it, it, I think I want you to not think about I have 10 predicates and I'm just building a semantic parser for those 10 predicates. Um, but I actually want to move on to the second part of my talk. I'll, I'm happy to talk, take questions a little bit later. Okay, so CodeLab is this platform that um, I've been working on over the last uh, three years, and the goal is to make research more efficient and reproducible. And the idea is that you know, whenever I tell people you know, I want reproducible research, you know, immediately there's a kind of reaction, there's this tension between the kind of efficiency of how quickly you can do research and reproducibility. But I want to say that um, you can actually have both, and the two are actually um, you know, really two sides of the same coin, okay? So the way CodeLab works is that there's a notion of bundles. Bundles are any immutable file or directory that can contain code or data or results of experiments. So they are either uploaded by the user or run on CodeLab. So for example, you might have Word2Vec, that's a program that's uploaded. ClueWeb is a data set that's uploaded. And then you can create this new bundle which contains word vectors. This is run in the CodeLab system and it maintains provenance of how these word vectors came about, what knowledge source it was used from. And then you can you know, use the word vectors in various experiments um, on this Q QA data set, and then you can ensemble things and so on. And the idea is that at every step in the pipeline, you're actually keeping track of the full provenance of how this uh, result arose. Okay? So let's uh, dive into a little bit about one of these uh, edges. Okay, so here's an example. So suppose you have a uh, confidence in Python and they have this MNES data set. What does it mean to kind of create a new bundle from it? Well, what we do is we take these two bundles and then we basically put them in a temporary directory inside a Docker container, which is this lightweight VM that has uh, an idea of kind of what version of um, you know, operating system it's running on. And then I'm going to, this bundle specifies a command. This can be any arbitrary shell command, which is run. When this command is run, it outputs a bunch of files, which are then copied back into the contents of this bundle. Okay, so that's the, the basic uh, flow. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so the idea now is that instead of having the research process work basically on, at the level of papers, right? So you see a paper on archive, you say, oh, let me go implement it or re-implement it, maybe they've re released some code, it's going to be at least one day, probably a week, uh, if they don't have any code or something, probably a month or never. Um, and instead, we're going to have this kind of um, building blocks depend on bundles, and the idea is that because this bundle is already existing in a system, and it's kind of certified to run or be in some format, it just really takes, I mean, a minute or you know, instantaneous to um, produce the new bundle. Okay, and I'll show some, show some examples. So an analogy I like to use is that, you know, um, you know, here we are kind of in the, you know, the days where we're kind of uh, moving around via horses and carriages. You know, it's very flexible. You know, you can go all over the place, but you re it's really slow, right? Because they're all pot potholes and you can't get to certain places. So I think with Cola, the vision is that we have this high-speed rail system where you have this whole provenance. It could be like 100 deep, but you can, because it's there, you can just run it through. And that enables you to go kind of much faster and much farther. Um, okay, so that's bundles, right? So basically, people upload bundles, um, which are code data, and then you can run them in the system. They're produced results. Um, the other aspect of Colab is worksheets. And the idea is that we have this bundle graph. This is the dependency graph. Um, but we don't want to look at that. We want to show kind of um, more a well presented version. And a worksheet is basically a document that contains some text descriptions and pointers into this bundle graph. So I'm going to say, here's the data set, and I'm going to compare two methods, and then I'm going to reference this. Okay. 
Um, so there's many, uh, so a worksheet um, in the website looks like this. Um, and there's kind of a markdown language that allows you to uh, type in kind of LaTeX or any sort of uh, markdown you want. You can embed bundles, you can formula, um, show the bundle contents, you can define a schema for displaying ta table of results, you can graph things, and you can actually embed these directives that allow you to show, for example, all your running bundles or all of the largest bundles or all the bundles in your project or whatever. So it's a pretty flexible system. Um, with this, you can uh, you know, do many things using worksheets. So you can um, use it as kind of research development environment. This is actually kind of the most, um, I think, common use case um, at least in my group, where people are basically using, running a bunch of things, and you can see kind of the different statistics and the states, so you, you can fire off like 20 jobs and not worry that they're clashing or, um, and you kind of, all the results are maintained here, so six months later you see this and you say, oh, how did I get uh, this number? Well, you know exactly where you got it from, okay? Um, We've been also using it to create executable papers. So here are two of the several papers from my lab where you have a description and then you have graphs. And these graphs are actually generated inside Coda Lab. So if you don't think this is sketchy, you can go and see the source code and see how it was generated. Um, we've also using it to benchmark results. So the web questions data set, uh, which we released three years ago, we have this uh, leaderboard where um, we have you know, different accuracies for the different systems. Um, we can also create tutorials about you know, TensorFlow or whatever. And all of this is you can do on the web interface, which I'll show. But there's also, I think, the most productive way to use Colab is using the CL command, which allows you to search for code and data, upload um, files just in one command. You can run arbitrary commands. Um, you can look at the output, you can kill jobs, remove things, um, and then you can actually um, you know, do other stuff too. Okay. So uh, the system architecture, just very briefly, is that there's a website and then there's a bundle service which the command line talks to. And then this is powered by a bunch of workers um, running on Microsoft Azure and um, Basically, whenever you run a command, this goes out to the workers and it you know, pumps the outputs back. Okay, so let me give a quick demo to show kind of what it looks like. Um, so if you go to Coda Lab, um, here you can look at the public home. It will show you kind of the, the papers that you can see that we have in the system, software, data sets, and so on. You can kind of just browse and say, Okay, let's click on this, and you can see one of the papers coming out of ACL this year with um, descriptions. Here's the code and data and all the experiments. Um, um, and so if you wanted to run something new, let's say that you want to, um, here's your my home, which you can think about as your home worksheet, like a home directory. Um, you can edit the markdown, so you can say hello. Um, okay, so that's exciting. Um, but you can also upload things. So I can upload, uh, let's say, I have the sentiment data set. That's polarity.train. Um, it has a UID. So this is kind of a unique, globally unique ID that's um, assigned once. So whenever I want to refer to this version of the data set, I just use this ID. So there's no confusion about what version I'm talking about. And then you can see the contents here. Um, let's all upload the test data. Um, I can upload, uh, let's see, here's a classifier. Okay, and which is some Python program. Um, okay, so now I can go and run things. So, okay, so what happens when I run? I first select the dependencies. So in this case, I'm gonna depend on all three. And what does it mean to depend on three? So you should, and then I'm gonna type in the command. So what it means is that it's like I'm in a directory, temporary directory somewhere, where I have files, uh, polarity.train, polarity.test, and text class.py, and I'm going to run some command. Okay, so if I were in this environment, I could type text class.py, train, polarity.train, test, polarity.test, and let's, there's some step size parameter, let's say 0.1. Okay, so then you say run. So this will start this run, and it's running, um, and uh, it's, 
OK, so while it's running, one thing we can do is we can customize um, the results. OK, so here are the experiments. So here's I can display graph. So this run generates a tab-separated file. Um, and I can say, use it to graph. So now I can use it to graph the error rates over time. And then, OK, so this one finished. I can actually rerun. So if you go up here, this is the web terminal that gives you kind of more fine-grained access. You can say, OK, let's rerun this with um, different hyperparameters. So 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. And then you can see kind of all these runs are kind of um, happening okay, on the graph. OK, so now suppose you wanted to um, you know, change the program. So if, imagine, OK, you're not happy with these results for some reason. So now I'm going to say, OK, let's, let's uh, create a different version of the program. Um, OK, so pretend I edit it. I'm not going to edit it. I'm just going to upload the same version. Um, so I upload text class again. Okay. So now let's suppose I want to rerun all these experiments with a new version of my program. So CoreLab, one thing that's really nice is that because it's maintained all the provenance of how these results came about and what I did with this text class, there's just one command. So the command is uh, mimic. Um, so I type mimic, and then I select the, the old program, and then I select the new program. And basically what it's going to do is run everything it did on the old program on the new program, okay? and including the formatting. So it's going to um, basically run all these four commands. But instead of using the old source code, it's going to use the new source code. And you can see the results appearing. Okay? So with this, I think you know, it's very easy to kind of um, experiment and um, build on top of um, other people's work. OK, any questions about what I did here, just very quickly? What if I run a very resource intensive task on that? Ah, so that's a good question. So currently, these are powered by Microsoft Azure. And uh, um, if you wanted, for example, you have your own cluster, you can actually run a script um, that uh, runs a worker that connects to Colab. And it'll basically run everything on your local machine and then put the results in Colab. So if you have your fancy cluster, you can also give other people access to your cluster uh, if you want to be generous. So, so the idea is that the, the computation and the, the presentation and management of results are kind of decoupled. Yeah, good question. OK, anything so else? language agnostic? Yeah, it's any language agnostic. So Docker, the way it works is that you specify an image, um, like Ubuntu 14.4. And it has some various things installed, and you can run whatever thing you want. If you want some other libraries, you install those libraries, and it can just pick it up. So anything, you know, C, Python, Ruby, C Sharp, Java, whatever. And you can mix and match them. Yeah. OK, let me quickly wrap up here. So um, how many of you use Jupyter, by the way? OK, so this is a pretty popular. So I think one of the um, the most similar projects is Jupyter. So it's similar kind of, if you look at it, you know, worksheets are like notebooks, right? Um, but there's some kind of uh, differences which I think are actually important behind the hood, right? So Colab offers these more the stronger rep reproducible guarantees, right? We have this commitment of you run something, it's immutable, and it's just sitting there that people can point to. So Jupyter, it has this you know, kernel that it's running, and you can basically, it's a kind of a mutation. So you can think about um, procedural versus functional programming, I guess. That's the way to think about it. Uh, the second point is that CodeLab is more modular. Instead of having these uh, notebooks, which are kind of self-contained, um, CodeLab has you know, the bundle graph, which is this global bundle graph. right? And worksheets are just pointers into this. So you can actually have. Let's say you have a data set that someone prepared, right? So this data set can appear in different worksheets, and you can kind of share the data set. Or let's say you process the data set. So you spend you know, one week of hard time processing this data set, and now you have some nice format. Now everyone can just take that and use it, and you know, know that their results are kind of traced back to the original data set via your processing. 
And if you want to change your processing, then because you have this trace, now you can run everything using the new processing. Um, compared to GitHub, so this is kind of the de facto way of sharing code and uh, mostly code right now. So it's not meant to be a replacement. So everyone should still use Git and GitHub um, because this doesn't do fine grain line by line version control and merges and whatever. So it's quite complementary. And but I'll point out that I think often when okay releasing code to GitHub is like a big big step from where we used to be. But it still is far from, I think, of reproducibility certificate, right? I mean, how many of you have tried um, downloading some code from GitHub and it just doesn't work? Okay, how many of you have not, actually? Okay, okay. so, and uh, within Microsoft, there's uh, Azure ML, which is uh, this kind of nice platform that allows people to quickly use machine, uh, a large machine learning toolbox. Um, Colab, compared to that, it's more, flexible because you're really just running arbitrary commands. So in some sense, it's kind of for the, the power user, right? And I think as researchers, we you know, need to be kind of on the cutting edge, changing our paradigms, and we're not just doing binary classification or you know, regression. Um, also, the second point is that there, it's more centered around these uh, papers, right? Which are kind of the, the thing that um, is um, you know, important in academia. So you have these papers, they're executable, you can have the results. And um, you can you know, reproduce, reproduce them and build on top of them. OK, so where do things stand? Um, so I think up until maybe about this year, I mean, this has been kind of a long process of just building up the system. Because there's actually quite a bit of um, things, as you can see, that needs to happen. So we have a kind of a modest number of users, bundles, worksheets, extra will papers. Um, and so far, you know, various conferences have been endorsing them, um, I wouldn't say that the usage has been, this has not kind of um, blown up in a way, um, in that um, usage is still kind of modest. Um, part of the reason I've been kind of keeping it low key is that, you know, um, when you're running people's random code, <laughs> you don't want to, I don't want this actually to go on, you know, um, you know, hacker news and have people like really stress testing the system. But now I think over the next uh, few months, I think things are stabilizing quite a bit. And now at this point, I think I would encourage all of you to try and check it out. Okay, so, and just to kind of emphasize, I think there's two ways in which Colab, I think, um, benefits uh, people. And I think it's worth distinguishing the two. The first is at the individual level, right? So why should anyone tr use CoLab? Well, first it avoids duplicate work. If someone already did it for you, you can just immediately build on top of it. it helps you manage experiments. I found this to be really crucial. I mean, to be able to just launch 100 jobs and not get confused about what version of what you're using. So even if you don't care about reproducibility, this is really useful. And furthermore, uh, you can you know, put things on CoLab and it helps kind of publicize your tools and data sets. Um, as a result of kind of these benefits, um, the community benefits I think are uh, greater in some sense because once you have a large community of people with these uh, data sets and resources, now I think it really starts changing the way that research you know, operates. Remember that the kind of the old horse and carriage via the um, and the, the high speed train. Now you can kind of combine components and you know, ensemble them in different ways. And it should really just be easy. Like if you read a paper, you want to try out something, you just go to Colab and you um, look at the command and you change a few things and then you should be on your way rather than having to go through like a week of time trying to um, email back and forth with the, the user. Okay, so I would like to kind of thank uh, the development team. A bunch of people contributed, including people at Microsoft and also um, students at Stanford. And with that, I will uh, conclude and take any questions. Thanks. It's because of an executable paper, or, yeah, I, I think this part of it. So somehow in the paper, for example, the ICML paper, or maybe uh, ICLR paper, so they can do today. Uh, yeah, so right now it's, it's still a little bit of a loose connection in a sense that typically you have a paper and in the PDF you say, okay, 
this, you click the link, and it goes to CodaLab, and then you basically have this um, document. Right, so the idea is that if you have a table okay, so in, in the PDF, yeah, the you click on this and say, where did this figure come from? And then you can play around with this. So you said that ICLI, ICML, DCF has that feature in some of the papers there? Oh. Um, well, I mean, right now it's just at the level of like, okay, building awareness where... Oh, I see, you know, okay, so far, right. it's not real. So there's not like any... Okay. You know, yeah. It's up to the authors what they want to do at this point. So what is the granularity of the access control? Can we basically share, can users share different types of modules or basically yeah. when they introduce one, it automatically all the dependencies will automatically be shared? So for every bundle and worksheet, you can mm -hmm. specify exactly who you want to read and write it. So it's more like AFS permissions. It's pretty fine-grained. Mm -hmm. So by default, everything is public, but you can obviously make things private if you want. Um, you can also install your own version of Colab and try it locally if you want as well. So how do you see this fitting in with something like Archive? Where or, you know, Archive is like the place to mm -hmm. sort of just upload your papers. Is, is this sort of like the place to upload your your data in this sort of provenance respecting way? Yeah, I think that's the right analogy. I mean, I think it's it'll still be a while before this kind of reaches kind of archive level, just because the, the bar for uploading a PDF is way lower than the bar for putting code and data and in the right place. So what a lot of what we've been trying to do is reduce the barrier of entry, trying to make this as easy and flexible to use. And I think the the mo mental model you should have is like, okay, if you're doing research, you're running a bunch of commands, and I want you to be able to run those commands as you would normally do, but we're going to just basically record what you did. Um, and and so so I guess from that perspective, you know, I think once this kind of um, you know takes off a bit more, I think I I think it will become kind of a more of a standard place that. You know, people can put code and data and experiments. Another question or well then as the come back to the right. Well let's thank Percy for those two wonderful talks <laughs> for that session. Thank you.